All right. Thank you all for coming today. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. We have a fantastic turnout today. And the following seminar is brought to you by nonprofit organization I Explore. We are dedicated to providing an extensive study and communication online platform for students around the world. We have over 80 teachers from multiple countries and over 500 students globally. I Explore provides free online classes and seminars to allow kids to learn and explore. In addition to this, our teachers encourage their students to harness creativity and develop critical thinking skills, allowing them to take their ideas to new heights, which is our model here at iExplore through our innovative class curriculums. I am honored to be introducing our presenter today, Ryan Kern, who also happens to be our president of iExplore. He will be guiding us on an awesome exploration of the cells in our body. So Ryan, take it away. Hello, everyone. I hope you guys are all doing well today. So today, just like it was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about biology and more specifically cells. So I'm going to start with a little overview of myself. Um, I currently go to Troy High School and I'm a 10th grader. Uh, let me try to use, oh, let me go back. Use a laser pointer. Here we go. And here I am. I love one of my hobbies I love to do is practice and play piano. I love playing piano at recitals and large groups. And also another hobby of mine is that I love to play water polo as well. And I really love playing water polo. I've been doing it since I was very young. And I'm just really thankful that I can play Somebody water polo drawing here. On the screen. And, oh yeah, someone is drawing the screen. Okay. And here, uh, here we can see that like I'm really interested in biology and what it really means for the world today. And that's why I want to eventually become a doctor because I'm really fascinated by it and I'm really passionate about it and interested in learning more. So let's continue on. Today we're gonna to be talking about the crazy cells in our body and we're gonna be learning about who we are literally. So first of all, here's just biology. We're gonna talk a little bit about what biology actually means as uh, like the textbook definition, but also what it means in real life and with broader implications for many different fields as well. So what is biology? Biology is the study of living organisms and of life. Here we see this is a piece of DNA that I uh, took, there's a picture of, and I thought it really represented biology well. But we also learned that biology is very broad. It's not necessarily just one very specific subject, like for example, cells that we're gonna be talking about. It can be applied to many different sciences and has a lot of, because of this, because it can be applied to many different drawings. sciences, because it can be applied to many different areas, this is why it's very important in our, our, in our everyday life. And yeah, there's down here, down here there's a microscope and there's also, uh, there's also a heart and a plant too. And this really shows just how important it, biology is to all the different kinds of, kinds of sciences and different fields there are. Okay, now let's move on to cells. So my first question for everyone is what do they think cells are? A, little tiny animals in our body, B, atoms, or C, the smallest structural and functional unit of an organism, typically microscopic and consisting of cytoplasm and a nucleus enclosed in a membrane. So the poll is released, you guys can go ahead and take a look at it. And so, uh, Kathy, how is the poll doing right now? Yep, and here are the results. So everyone picked C, which is the correct answer. So let me just close these results here. And let's see, I can go here. Yep, and we see that C is the correct answer. So let's move on. Let's first talk about the animal cell which is one of two kinds of cells that there are in our body. Sorry, not in our body, but in general. 
Here we have uh, the nucleus, cell membrane, ribosome, mitochondria, and the cytoplasm. There's a lot more complex structures, but here is the main ones that we're going to be talking about for this lecture. And in the future, we're going to be talking about some of the other structures more in depth as well. Uh, I'm going to try to get this drawing off of the screen here. Um, yeah, let me try to erase it real quick. Okay, can people please stop drawing? Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to be, but okay, we have this simplification of our animal cell here, which it has the very main and major components, but there's actually a more complicated model that many people use today. For example, if you're a biologist, today you're going to be looking at more of the detail in the cell and also like all the different kinds of organelles, which I'm gonna show really quick, just so you guys get a preview if, because this is gonna be a series of seminars. If you guys want to do and attend more seminars in the future, I'll be talking about some of these more in depth as well. So here's a cell with a lot of different labels and complex parts, which we're not gonna talk about today, but we'll save for a future seminar. Next one, the plant cell. Uh, so the plant cell is obviously going to be in plants and everywhere else. And let me try to erase some more here. Okay, I think this is the last of it. Okay, great. So now I don't have any drawings here. So for the plant cell, we're also going to use a little bit of a simplification. So this way we get the main concepts down. And here, is, here it is. As we see, there's a lot of similar parts here. Nucleus, there's also the cytoplasm, the cell membrane. But there's a couple new parts as well, the cell wall and chloroplast and vacuole. Again, this is just an overview because we're going to talk about all of the simplified structures in this seminar. So don't worry if you don't understand right now. And if we look at the more scientific and complex model here, we have a lot of 3D structures here and a lot of more complex names, which I will go over in the future seminars. Now I have another question for everyone is how many cells do they think are in our body? A, 400 cells, B, 10,000 cells, or C, 1 million cells, or D, 30 trillion cells. So go ahead, take your time and vote. Okay, we'll give everyone a couple more seconds now to vote. And here are the results. So once again, everyone keeps choosing the correct answers. Nice. So yes, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the correct answer is D, which is 30 trillion cells. That is 30 with 12 zeros. So that's a lot of cells in our body. This is because the cells are very, very tiny. So that's why when you have like a full grown adult, there's going to be a lot of cells inside of them. Okay, does anyone have any questions so far on anything we've gone over? Just with the overview of the animal cell or the overview of the plant cell or anything that they would like to like me to answer? Uh, Kathy, could you please read the questions because I can't see the chat right now? Well, I don't think there aren't, I don't think there's any questions right now. Okay, great. So then if not, we're gonna move on here to our next section. We're gonna begin to talk about the different organelles. Here we have the nucleus that we talked about. This was in both the plant cells and the animal cells. And this is, once again, a more complex diagram, so you get a good idea, because a lot of the times these drawings are like 2D. They're just on a piece of paper. But in real life, they're actually 3D. So a real cell is going to be like a ball, like an animal cell. And then a plant cell is going to be more of like a rectangular box. So we need to keep that in mind whenever we're looking at these organelles and looking at these pictures because we need to remember that it just sometimes they simplify it so it's easier for us to get the main concept. And so a lot of these, these structures and functions here of this nucleus cell specifically, I'm gonna go over in future seminars, but it's just so you get a great idea of what the nucleus looks like. And here on the right are real life cells that have their nucleus dyed with a special fluorescence. So it's a chemical that will specifically go to the nucleus 
and make it a super bright color. This way, when the biologists are looking in the microscope and they're looking in, it's easy for them to spot the nucleus. And this is just really cool because this is how they use and discover a lot of different types of organelles and it's really easy for them to see. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about why the nucleus is so important. You can almost think about it like our brain in a way because our brain is controlling our body just like the nucleus is controlling the cell. But here is also another analogy and the, that shows the nucleus's structure and also how important it is for us. So we have many different genes I'm sure you've heard of and they hold different properties. So let's say that we have like a, a trait called like eye color here. So everyone's eye color. This is gonna be stored inside the gene I was talking about, which is gonna be inside this DNA. This DNA, think of it like almost like a spring, but it's kind of like a rope as well. And when you compress it, you can compress it a lot and you can kind of twist it. It eventually becomes this thing called a chromosome. These chromosomes are stored inside the nucleus. And this is where all the genetic information is. So the reason, let's say I have brown eyes is because inside my genes, there's a special gene for brown eyes and it's stored in the nucleus of every cell. As we'll talk in the future, not all of these genes are actually expressed, which is why I don't have like brown eyes on my hands. They're only in my eyes. So that's a very interesting topic we can go into further depth later. Next, we're gonna talk about another really important structure of our cells is the mitochondria. Here, once again, is a 3D structure to remind us that not all these organelles are just flat and like a piece of paper. They're actually real life 3D, just like us. And we see that there's also a really, there's a couple layers of membrane, which we don't really need to worry about right now, but it helps you get an overview of what a mitochondria looks like. Again, on the right side, here is a very zoomed in picture of the mitochondria. Usually a mitochondria would not be this big in the cell, it'd be pretty small. But again, we can see how fluorescence and the chemicals they use to make them turn very bright colors is so important in recognizing which one is the mitochondria. And it also differentiates the middle kind of liquid in here from the sides by having the sides be pink and the insides blue. So this is a very important tool again for recognizing and identifying these organelles by having them be colored. Mitochondria are very important because they're actually responsible for the energy in our body. And I'm gonna talk about in the next slide when what happens when we eat something and how we can convert that and turn that into energy that we actually use. So let's say for example, for lunch or dinner, you had a hamburger here or a cheeseburger then so you're gonna eat that and it's go down your throat into your stomach. And what your stomach cells are gonna do, they're gonna actually break it down first before they begin to absorb the nutrients. Then it's gonna to go to the small intestine where actually most of the nutrients are gonna be absorbed first. But how is this nutrients really being absorbed and used? This is where the mitochondria comes in. For the cells, the mitochondria provides a lot of the power. In fact, you also, We'll hear a lot of people say the mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell, which is a very common term. So this ends up converting your hamburger after it's been broken down by your stomach into this thing called ATP. You don't really need to worry about ATP right now. People are going to say it in the future and I'll talk about it more, but it's the same thing as energy. And this energy allows us to do whatever we need to do. We can go play basketball, swim, run, jump, it's all because of our mitochondria that we can do these amazing things. Next, we're gonna talk about the ribosomes. Ribosomes are also very important, but they're kind of like the construction workers of our cells and also like the factories. Their job is to make these things called proteins. We're not gonna to talk too much about them in depth right now, but you just need to know that there are some that are on the nucleus. As you can see here, all these dots, those are ribosomes, and some are attached to the nucleus, some are just in the cytoplasm, and they're the cell's protein factories, and on the right-hand side here, 
This is just a ribosome. Again, we're just doing a general overview, so you don't have to worry too much about each of these, as in the future, I'm gonna go over them more. This is a very cool video of a ribosome actually making a protein. So we're gonna watch it quickly, and then this will give you a good idea of how ribosomes actually work. There's, gonna, there's not gonna be any sound for the video. So as you can see here, there's a ribosome, which is this really big part here, and it's spitting out like these things called amino acids. If you thought of a protein as like a building, the amino acids could be like the bricks, and they build up the ribosome is like the factory as it's assembling all these bricks together into the final shape. And just like how the bricks are gonna be stacked on top of each other, that's why it keeps changing shape throughout the whole video. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the next one. So here's the analogy again. We can think of ribosomes that make proteins as factories. And these factories, we can think of them making like robots. Because robots, we know, do a lot of different kinds of work and they do them really well. This is just like the proteins inside our cell. Because after the ribosomes make the proteins, the proteins have a lot of options. They can go to the outside of the cell or they can stay inside and do some work but they're like robots and they just do a very wide range of important tasks for our cell and they're very important. Does anyone have any questions? I know we covered kind of a lot of material so fast, but if you guys have any questions, you can uh, let type them, I guess, in the chat or yeah, just let uh, me know. Someone asked the question, why do we have cells? So, we have cells just because it's kind of what we're made of right now. Um, long time ago, people believed that there was like a lot of cells, just single cells, so just like one cell. We are made up of, like I said, 30 trillion cells, which is all these cells put together. And what, a very interesting that happen, thing that happens when these cells are put together is they begin to have new properties. So let's say uh, you look at like a bacteria, or you look at moss, these things are all single cell organisms, which just means they only have one cell. And when they're not combined together into a bigger organism, they can't do all the stuff that we can do. Think about bacteria. A bacteria can't go swimming, they can't play the piano, they can't do a lot of different things like us. And this is because they're just one cell. And it's kind of like when you have a team that's working together, you can do a lot more than just having one person. So that's the same with cells. You just have one cell, it can't really do much. It can survive, it can kind of be alive, but it's not gonna be able to do as much as we are here. In fact, the reason that, the, the fact that we have so many cells is allowing us to be in this seminar right now and learn more about our own cells. Okay, so that's the question I'm gonna answer for now. If you guys have more questions, we're gonna have a, uh, time where we can answer more questions at the very end. So just make sure you write it down like a piece of paper so you don't forget. Okay, we're gonna move on. Next, we're gonna talk about the cytoplasm. I know you guys have been like hearing me say cytoplasm, oh, the cytoplasm. And so what is the cytoplasm? Here on the diagram, we have the 3D shape again of the cell. You can see this in the nucleus, there's a mitochondria, and here are a couple other organelles that we don't need to worry about right now. But the cytoplasm is this pink fluid. In this diagram, it's pink, but in real life, it's like clear. The cytoplasm, like I'm gonna use a further analogy later, is very important because it's like holding all of the organelles. And it's kind of helping them just stay there and stay inside the cell. And it makes sure they don't like bump into each other or cause problems like that. And here we have a real life pair of cells and you can see that the cytoplasm is different from the outside environment. So what that means is let's say it's a very hot day outside, right? Let's say it's like for some reason 110 degrees outside, it's very hot. But on the inside, we are not 110 degrees. We're still like around 98. We might go up a little bit, but we're not gonna go immediately to match the outside 110 degrees. This is also, can be paralleled to the cytoplasm because if we see the color difference between the outside here 
and the inside here, we can see that there's a difference. And that means that inside the cell, the cytoplasm is creating a different environment than the outside. So this means that the cell can still be alive in like different conditions. Just like we can be alive if it's raining outside, we're not going to freeze to death immediately. Or if it's snowing outside, we're not going to become super cold. Or if it's really hot, we're not going to become immediately super hot. This kind of helps regulate us so we can live in like many different environments too. And here is my analogy here. So if a cell were a soup, the cytoplasm is going to end up being the watery part here. And if we think about the cell, like this is like maybe an animal cell because it's round, we can see that the cytoplasm, the watery part, and all these different organelles, we can pretend they're organelles. And that's a very good representation of the actual cell, except for the fact that these are all like touching, but they're going to be kind of separate. But it's very realistic as in the cytoplasm is what all the organelles are in. So it's just like a soup with the carrots and potatoes and beef all inside the soup. Now we're going to talk about the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is actually really interesting and a lot of people over time as scientists have studied it because it has so many functions. It's very important for the cell and it acts like a border for different, for different things to go in and out. Here on the left we have a kind of like complex looking diagram. Again, I just want to show you so you kind of know what the cell membrane will look like. And you can see that a very interesting property is you have this top layer and you have this bottom layer. So it has like kind of two layers to the membrane. And we have all these different uh, proteins and you know cholesterol and all sorts of things inside. But the cool thing is actually really interesting is that we see all these proteins here they actually just move around the cells. So it's not like they just stay in one spot on the cell membrane. The cell membrane kind of like shifts and you can think of it like sort of like a soup, except sometimes it's not gonna fall apart. It's gonna be more like rigid, but other times it's very flowy. And on the right hand side, we see another example of the real cell membrane in some of the cells here too. You see this really thin, thin line around the cells. You can see that that's the cell membrane. And I'm going to actually talk a little bit, okay, I'm going to go back, a little bit about why the cell membrane is so important. So the cell membrane is going to act kind of like the border control or border checkpoint officers do between two different countries. Let's say that we have a border between the U.S. and Canada and we want to move, let's just pretend we're using actual water. We want to move water across. Well, the cell membrane will regulate that. So it'll be like, does the cell need water? Do I need water? Okay, if I do need water, then let's let this water go through. But to a certain point, there's gonna be enough water. And then it's be like, no, I don't need any more water. So it's kind of like that. And then it's always looking for a balance, but sometimes it's actually looking for an imbalance that would help it become stronger. So if we look here right now, this is also just like you because right now we see there's not that much water in the cell and there's a lot of this like salt stuff. So if you think about it, you eat a french fry that's really salty, you always usually want water afterwards. You can think about this like your cell. The cell, if the cell ate a french fry and then it was super thirsty, it needs water. And so outside of the cells, there's a lot of water just in the blood or wherever. And so that water is going to want to go inside and the cells can be like, yes, you can come inside because I need that water. However, let's say you have a super salty French fry, right? And you eat it. And then someone's like, do you want another super salty French fry? And you're like, no, I don't because it's too salty already, right? So that's like the cell as well. And these salt, thing, these salt circles here, the salt like um, ions, they're actually not going to go in because the cell already has a lot of that salt. Now we're going to do a really cool experiment with an egg. So I don't know if you guys actually knew this or not, but an egg is technically one cell. We'll talk about why certain things can be like considered one cell and others not later. But an egg, even though it's really big, it's still considered one cell. And we can do a lot of interesting things with it as an experiment to see how the water will move across 
the membrane. And so here we have the vinegar and the corn syrup experiment. We're gonna have another video right here. There's no sound to this one, but it's gonna show us how you can use this, these eggs and then make, make your own experiment at home. Oh, here we go. Let me pause it real quick and slow it down. Okay, because this one kind of goes fast. So if you guys see here, we have a video and this is the experiment. What you need to do is you need to take two raw eggs and you can take two glasses of water and also, uh, sorry, just two glasses and then you need vinegar and corn syrup. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna first fill both of the glasses up with vinegar. This is gonna do a very interesting thing because what happens is with the vinegar, once you put in the egg, it's gonna to begin to dissolve the actual outside of the egg. And so you just wait 24 hours or one day. And then when you take it out, it's gonna become almost squishy and bouncy. Let's see him take it out. The, yes, the shells are gone because they've been dissolved and he can just squish it, but it's still raw. Now we're gonna take it one step further. We're gonna fill one glass halfway with corn syrup and the other with water. Then we put both of the same two eggs that we took out of the vinegar, put them in each, wait one more day, and then when you take them out, something very interesting is gonna to happen to both of them. And so we're gonna talk about this as osmosis in the future and more in detail about why this happens, but it's a very interesting experiment that you can actually do at your home right now. So let me pause the video here. We see that this egg that was put in the corn syrup, it had more water inside of the, the egg, so we can think of it like a cell. There's not enough water outside the cell, so then the water is gonna go outside. Because the corn syrup, if you ever use corn syrup, it's super thick. So there's not that much like liquid in it. So then the water that is very fluid and has a lot of liquid, will actually go outside the cell because it wants to make the outside more liquid. But on the other hand, you take pure water like that and you put in the egg, well, it's not really gonna change. It might grow a little bit because more water goes in, but inside the cell, there's already a good amount of water. Outside the cell, there's already a good amount of water. So nothing's really gonna change in size. Yeah, so that's it. And then we're gonna go over osmosis a little bit in this lecture, but also in the future. So if you guys are more interested on like, why does this happen? I'll be answering those questions too. Now we're gonna talk about something else with water the vacuole. In the vacuole, we can see that in the plant cells and animal cells, uh, the vacuole is like kind of different. We'll take a look on the left side. Here we have a huge vacuole. And I'm going to keep using this word vacuole, but what it really means is you can think about it like a bag of water almost. You have like, let's say, or, or like a water bottle. You carry around a really big water bottle that has a lot of water on a very hot day. So you can drink from it time to time. Just like the cell as well. If the cell is super dry outside and it needs water, where is it gonna get it? It's very easy if there's already water in this kind of bag like vacuole here. And, but if we notice on the other hand, the animal cell has a very small vacuole. Why is this? Because look on the outside, the animal cell only has this very thin, kind of flimsy, like I said, it kind of moves around a lot, membrane. While the plant cell has this very rigid cell wall that's like a box, like a very hard wooden box that we're gonna talk about. And so the central vacuole is so important for its function because have you ever seen it when you don't plant, sorry, when you don't water a plant, it'll begin to wilt and then it starts to fall over and then it becomes like eventually dies, right? But if you keep watering it, it'll stay straight up. This is because the water inside of the plant cells 
will cause it to kind of expand. And then when it expands just a little bit, it'll begin to kind of like sit up straight. That's why whenever you water it, it'll always be up like this. Here on the right side, it's not clearly labeled, but if you notice, all of these organelles are on the side. And what's in the middle is the vacuole because it's so big compared to the rest of the cell. Now we're gonna move on to the cell wall that I was just talking about. Here, the cell wall is kind of like a thick wall and you can think of it like a very, very tough rubber. It will expand a little bit, but it's not gonna expand a lot. And it's not gonna really wanna, uh, it's not gonna really wanna get smaller either. So it likes to be at one single kind of size. It'll move a little bit out if it gets bigger, which is like the, the vacuole, there'll be more water inside. So it causes the cell to get a little bigger. But other than that, it doesn't want to change that much. So it's very rigid, which is why the plant cells, like I said, they like to stand up and then they're very rigid like this. Another interesting thing is we see here is almost like a puzzle. Each of the plant cells here, they're all like connected together to the other plant cells and they're literally touching. And we're gonna talk more about why they're actually touching and what connects them too in this seminar. So, so far, does anyone have any other additional questions? We can probably go over one or two before we have to move on. Uh, the first question I have here is, uh, how fast do the cells go? Um, do they mean like how fast do the cells move? Yeah, I think if they're asking if the cells move at all. Yeah, so it really depends. The cells usually at some point or another will move, but it really depends on the cells because if you notice, there's so many different kinds of cells in our body. Like I said before, I don't have an eye on my hand because there's special eye cells in my eye and there's special skin cells and hand cells for my hand. So this causes it to have really different functions for each kind of cell. Like I, with my ear, you can bend it, right? And my hair is really bendy. But then my bones are hard and they're rigid and they won't bend or they'll break. So it's kind of like that where each cell has a certain baseline or basic functions that it will do. But other than that, it'll be very specific and just to what it's made to do. So the hair is made to be kind of soft and be like flimsy, but the bones are supposed to provide structure for my body, so they're gonna be hard. Okay, uh, uh, I, I think maybe we can do one more question. Oh yes, go ahead. So in the previous slide, you showed us a picture of like a cell you're talking about um, this one? Like a rock, like a cell that's in the, in your body. How do they take that picture exactly? So, okay. These cells are not in our body exactly, really, because these are the plant cells. But good question. How do we get all these nice pictures that I put in the corner here of all these different cells and everything? Well, what actually happens is if you guys ever used a microscope, which is a very cool thing to do, and you can actually buy one on your own and kind of put your own things underneath and kind of see what it is, it's very cool. But if you look inside, you can actually see the cells inside and everything, right? But the question is, how do you take a picture? Well, some people that are like scientists, they have special uh, adapter that I can like put onto it that will take a picture as well. But for me, when I was at... Um, when I was at Troy as a freshman, we had to do an experiment and we needed pictures from the microscope. So we just put the camera, pretending it was the eye, and just took a picture from the microscope. So, okay, yeah. I also have one more question. Uh, could you please hold your questions? We want to get through the lecture, then we can uh, answer the questions at the end. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to move on here to a very another interesting part of cells is like how do we grow? and how do cells divide really? So cells divide in a process called mitosis. Again, mitosis is just the scientific word for how these cells are ending up and dividing and how the DNA, which is like our genetic information, how it gets passed on. 
we're going to watch this really cool video that shows actual kidney cells dividing. But the interesting thing is with kidney cells, unless you're growing, like from just being born all the way to maybe depending on how old, uh, depending on your like specific body, maybe like 16, 18. But if you're an adult, those cells are not going to grow anymore. They've stopped growing. But they will reproduce and divide again if, let's say, you get some kidney damage. So if you had a cut, the cells will divide to fix the cut. But other than that, they're not going to keep growing bigger and bigger. Because if you're an adult, you've already reached that point. You're good. Your kidney cells, they're already working hard. They're doing their job. That's all you need. So we're going to watch this really cool uh, video here. And if you notice, you see all this green and this red. And you're like, well, is that the actual color in real life? No, it's not. What they did is they used the fluorescence again to show it. Because when they use the fluorescence, it makes it so much easier to see, oh, these are like the DNA. Oh, these are what's the two cells pulling apart. But if we didn't use the fluorescence, it would be so hard for eyes to really see it. So I'm just going to uh, play it. It's going to go kind of fast, but there's many different cells dividing. So you hopefully will see all of them. So what's actually happening is all the red parts, that's the genetic information. And then it's kind of pulling apart and it's separating into the cells. So each of them have their own. And it's always lining up at this really precise line, which is really cool too, which we can talk about in the future as well. And we just see it happening over and over again. Yep. And it's very important because if cells can't divide, then we're stuck at being a one cell organism. And like we said before, those one cell organisms cannot really do much at all. They can't go swimming, play piano. They can't even really eat food like we do. So that's why it's so important for our cells to divide, divide so we can become multicellular, which just means more multiple cells. So like I was talking about, we have different exceptions that we talk about with cells dividing. So the exception is they don't really divide in your kidneys all the time or in your brain. Again, if you're growing, they're going to keep dividing because they need to reach that fully mature state where they can eventually just stop growing, stop reproducing, unless there's some damage. Then it'll start growing again. This is why we keep getting bigger and stronger and taller and grow up because our cells are just constantly dividing until we reach that mature point. Then after that, then we just don't grow anymore unless there's damage to our cells. Now we're going to talk about another function of the cell membrane is this thing called uh, pinocytosis. You don't really need to memorize it or worry about it. But really just think about how the analogy of how I was saying if you're thirsty after you eat a salty fry, you want to drink some water? Well, how's the cell going to drink water if it doesn't have the water? Just like how you drink a bottle of water, the cell's going to try to do the same thing. We look out here. Let's pretend this is all water, which it usually is. The cell is going to make little pinches, little pockets in its membrane to collect the water. Then it'll close them and then take them inside the cell. This is kind of like, let's say you have trucks that need to take water somewhere. They all line up here. They all have the water loaded inside the truck. Then they all drive into the, past the border, which is the cell membrane. And they drive in and they take the water to the cell. And here is a real life example of this. You can see all these different little sacs forming and filling them with water. Another example of a different function is called phagocytosis. This one is just like how we eat. Cells also want to eat sometimes. And this is actually very important because if you ever think about your immune system, your immune system 
is responsible for killing all the bacteria and viruses that are inside your body. But how did they actually do it? We always hear it, oh, the immune system like, killed the bacteria. But they actually do it by engulfing the bacteria. They just like take in the whole thing and then they just dissolve it eventually with different like acids that they have and that just breaks it up. Here is an overview of the two we talked about, pinocytosis here and then the phagocytosis. And then one more we didn't talk about was receptor mediated endocytosis. Sounds really complicated, it's not that bad. We can compare this one to kind of like having a marble bag, right? Let's say we have a bag. Inside there's red marbles, green marbles, blue marbles, but we only want the red marbles. So we're only gonna take out the red marbles. That's what this is doing in the cell as well. If you notice here, they use stars. These little pinchers are only picking up those stars and then they just pocket and they go inside the cell. Pretty simple. Here's an example of the one we just talked about here, the receptor mediated. And you can see they're all lining up here. Just like we close, the red marbles all go in here and then we just close it up, take it in. We're not gonna spend too much time on this. I have one more question for you guys. How do you guys think the cells in our body stick together? Because we talked about the one cell organisms, but how do we become multi-cell with all of them working together, like sticking together? A, they magically touch and connect. B, there is a glue inside all of us. Or C, there are connected fibers. So go ahead, take a couple seconds here to vote and we'll see what you guys did and how well you guys did. Okay, we're gonna give everyone just a couple more seconds here and we can post the results afterwards. Okay, I think a good number of people have voted. So here you can see that, once again, man, you guys are so good. Always picking the correct answer. There are connected fibers is the correct answer. And let me explain why this is. So yay, C is the correct answer. But before I explain why, is there any questions on anything we covered before? So before this, we talked about these different parts where you can take in like water like you're drinking or like eating or like this receptor mediated endocytosis part. We also talked about the cell growth. Yeah. So is there any questions about anything? Uh, one of the really interesting questions I got is that our brain cells structurally di different from normal cells and do they have nucleus and such? That's a great question to whoever asked that. That's a very good question. So like I said, the cells are very specialized. So there's a basic baseline that all cells have to meet. They have to have a nucleus. They have to have some of the mitochondria. They have to have like the ribosomes because they're just important. But, on, but besides that, really the shape and function can kind of change. If you actually look in a special kind of squid, I believe, there's this, they have the brain neurons that are usually very long. They're actually super long that you could actually see them. They're so big and so long, but they don't really divide unless, like I said, there's some damage. And structurally, they're mostly similar to a lot of the cells because otherwise all the cells would be completely different and they wouldn't be able to really be like compatible. And work together but there's some differences and some like similarities which we can talk about later uh, I think just the main difference is the shape as well because for many of the different cells the shape is really what defines their function so the shape of like my hand is based on the cells whereas like my ear is some other cells yeah great question the I think we can answer one more question too all right. Another interesting question I got was that can cells break? So how are they repaired? 
So let's, that's a great question again. So let's think about our skin cells here. We have our skin cells all over our hand, right? And we get a cut. Oh no. But the good thing is we have blood cells and that have these little like platelets that can come together and bind it up. So yes, cells can break because if you were to accidentally cut yourself with a knife, there's, it's very likely there's going to be a cell there and it's just going to cut in half and the cell's going to end up dying because all of its like stuff that it needs, the DNA, the nucleus is going to be all over the place and it's not going to be good. But the good thing is we're going to get to this again uh, just very shortly here in the couple, next couple of slides. There's this, the fibers that we're talking about can come together and reconnect. And this is why when we get cut, it can heal. And then let's say, it depends on how, how fast you heal, but a couple of weeks, you look at it, it's like it's gone. It's completely just renewed. And so that's also the very interesting and cool part of how these connected fibers can reconnect after there's been some like breakage. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the extracellular matrix here. So like I was talking about here, we have the cell membrane and these long fibers. Once again, this is just to give you a general idea of what we're talking about before we start talking about the extracellular matrix. Some examples of cells that really depend on the extracellular matrix like a lot because most cells really just always need it anyway, but there are special cells that really depend on it. This is actually the muscle cells. Because if you think about it, when you flex your arm, all the cells have to come together and then they have to contract and they can come together like that. But how does that happen? It's because all the cells are very tightly linked to the other cells. And this allows it for them to almost act as one movement. So then they can all contract at once and move, and all contract at once and move. This is why I can move my hand like this, I can bend my fingers, because they're all moving together and like relaxing and contracting. And once again, here in the top right, we have the muscle cells. Like I said before, they allow us to flex, get our nice biceps here, but without them, let's think about what would happen. Without having actual muscle cells that are contracting and flexing, we wouldn't be able to breathe because that helps, that is actually controlled by muscles. We wouldn't really have a heart. We wouldn't be able to blink our eyes, speak, move anything really. And we wouldn't be alive that much. And we'd be kind of back to the one cell organisms I was talking about. And we'd be just like jello. Although some one cell organisms can move around and they have little tails that we'll talk about later. But the thing is just the muscle cells have such a large importance for our bodies and our everyday lives. Just think about everything that you do every day and how if you didn't have any muscles, like it's impossible. Thank you guys all for listening to this uh, seminar. Thank you guys so much. Now we're gonna take some time to go over the more complex questions or questions that we didn't get to. So I just wanna thank you guys for all coming and if you guys have any questions, go ahead and we'll answer them. All right, so I got a question. It's how do cells age? Okay, so we're gonna talk about this probably because it's kind of specific later, but cells age because we have our DNA, right? We said it's like a rope, stretch out the rope. At the ends, there's these, these kind of like buffers or like a cap that protects the DNA that's on the inside. If you think about a paragraph, right? Let's say you write a sentence. I want to go to my friend's house. But let's say for whatever reason, just some accident happens, the period gets deleted. That's okay. But if you delete one more, then you delete the D off of like, or yeah, delete off of friends, D off of friends. But if you have extra periods, let's say in the front and the back, and you accidentally delete it, it's okay. So what happens when we age is what I'm trying to say here is that with the rope, there's extra there's extra parts that are just duplicated to protect the DNA. What'll happen is occasionally, let's say just like there's some acid or something or an enzyme comes and accidentally cuts it off. But since we have that repeated sequence, repeated part, it actually protects the DNA. So if it's cut off, it's okay. But then over time, as more of these just accidental cuts or just something happens with the DNA, over time it gets shorter and shorter. 
And then this is where we really see some problems start to occur is when we don't have any more space. Because if we have a sentence, I want to go to my friends, but then you delete friends, the entire sentence has a different meaning now. And if you keep deleting, all of a sudden, there's no meaning in the sentence. And that's kind of like our genes. If I had my brown eyes as a gene and you delete half of it, it's not going to have the brown eyes again. It's going to have something else. So we can talk about that more later, but that's just a little insight into what we'll talk about in the future seminars. That was a great question. All right. Another heavily debated question in the comment section is that can we change DNA? So yes, we actually can change DNA and there's been a lot of research with it over the past like many decades and they've really in order to be able to learn how to change it, you have to know as much as you can about it. And they've done this thing called sequence the entire human genome, which means they've taken and learned about all the different genes and what they do, or mostly what they do, not all of what they do, but in our bodies. Oh, wait a second, could you repeat the question? Because I just got a little carried away here. Yeah, uh, the question was, can we change DNA? Yeah, so this leads me to my point, because we have all this knowledge, we can actually physically take the DNA out of the cell using special procedures, and this will allow us to actually change it and make some like modified organisms which is uh, very interesting, but also has some like social implications, which are kind of conflicting too, because you have such a power to change DNA, given, and obviously it's not perfect, it's not going to give you like what you want immediately, it's not like that, but still, you have the power to change it, what does that mean? Like, what is going to happen with that power? It's a very, very strong power, and people really need to think about it before they just start using it for whatever. Great question. All right, so on a related note, someone asked, can we use DNA modification to bring back extinct animals? I would say no, but I, I don't know completely on that such like specific topic. But here's what I know is that, let's say we have a dinosaur that died millions of years ago. The cells are not gonna be alive in that dinosaur but we can take the DNA out, which should still be okay. But the problem is we take out the DNA. Again, the dinosaur was like gone for like long, long period of time. We already said how like in a short amount of time, we can already have like ends of the DNA cut off. Well, what if we have like huge segments just missing? So then what do we do, right? We try to use that DNA and we can put in like, let's say a reptile, like a lizard, see if we can try to recreate it. But a lot of the times it's hard because you have a sentence, right? Let's say you have a whole paragraph, but then all of a sudden weird words are missing. And then there's so many words that are missing, you don't know like what the paragraph actually meant. And that's why with so much DNA missing sometimes, it's really hard to do that, which is why, because at this point, since we have so much knowledge, it would be very easy, hypothetically, just take the DNA, just put it in a different reptile. Oh, there we go, we have a dinosaur now. But it's not how it works like that because the DNA has over time just kind of broken down, kind of thinking about how a bike you just leave out a bike, it begins to rust. You can't use it anymore. So like that. All right. Another question we got was that how does the water get into the vacuole? Great question. So we were talking about the penocytosis, which is the cellular drinking. That's really how the water is going to end up getting inside the vacuole. Um, yeah. And then there's also the cell wall. and But the cell wall actually has little pores that will allow in certain things, but it's just not as open as the cell membrane, which is in the animal cell. Like, because we said the animal cell, cell membrane is always moving. It can let in stuff very easily. But if you think about it, we have, have like a border between US and Canada. And let's say on the cell membrane, you can go across at any point in the border. But for a plant cell, there's only like maybe, let's say 20 points across the line of the border that you can actually go across. So even though there's a huge part that has a cell wall and everything, there's only certain parts where water can go in. But for cells, it's very, very important that they have enough, or for, sorry, for plant cells specifically, it's very important they have enough water because if they don't, we said that that cell wall is very rigid. When the cell begins to shrink because there's less water, the cell wall just stays there and then the cell begins to just shrink and it's still connected 
and then it just dies like that, which is why it wilts over. All right, so I have a fun question. When we bleed, do cells fall out? Yes, yes, they do. So the blood has red blood cells, and those are cells. And also in our blood, we have like a little white, sometimes white blood cells, and sometimes like the little platelets that are kind of like our internal bandages will bleed they'll form a clot and stop the bleeding so yes they do fall out and if you actually let's say you get like a bloody nose and you want to study it you could take some of the blood and if you had your own microscope take a look and there actually are cells in there all right um what color is the dna oh i mean what color is a cell so the cells like we said, we use fluorescence to make them colorful, and the diagrams are colorful to help us just simplify it. When you look at many different cells, it's very, very hard to really compare them because I said they're very specific. Like my skin, let's say on this side's tan maybe, but on the other side's very white and very light. But my hair is dark. So it's kind of, it really, once again, depends on the function of the cells and it can vary a lot but for let's say most cells they're not going to have that much color they're going to be mostly colorless because unless the color gives them some advantage there's no reason because it'd be like extra work but there's no benefit all right and i got two questions that are quite similar one what is the shape of a cell and two how do vacuoles keep their shape Cool. So the shape of the cell depends on um, depends on a lot of things. Like we said, cells they're actually usually just very long. It's like one cell kind of elongated. And but the typical animal cell, uh, people, the scientists have looked at many different cells in the ant body, and they conclude that the, the typical one is usually just round. While the plant cell one is gonna be like a box and very rigid, like a rectangle. And yeah, for the vacuole question, where like what the shape of the vacuole is, again, we think of like a bag of water, it can move into any shape really. So it's not a fixed shape and its shape does not really matter as much as the, the actual shape of the cell. It's just there to hold water. All right, so I think I got most of the questions, but I might have missed a few. So if any of you have questions, then uh, just, oh, hang on, I just got one. But why don't the water drip out of the va vacuole? Good question. So just like a plastic bag, why doesn't the water drip out of a plastic bag? It's because what the vacuole is made out of, it's specifically designed, is made out of like these molecules that are very, let's say, tight together. So they form a really tight junction and a connection so that way no water can leak through. So you can think of it like a plastic bag where it's super tight and it's so tight that the molecules are like tighter than the water, water molecule can fit. So it can't go through anymore. It's just like stuck. All right, here's another one. What happens when the cell loses water? Okay, this is, this is a very cool topic and very interesting as well. This is definitely going to be a, a bigger part of our future lectures, but I'll talk about it a little bit right now. Two different things happen for each different cell. So I already talked a little bit about how the plant cell, when it loses water, the cell membrane, because remember, there's actually two parts of the plant cell on the outside. There's the cell wall and the cell membrane that's on the inside. The cell membrane will follow where the water is like shrinking, so then it'll kind of like separate. It'll still try to be a little attached, but it's really hard for the cell to be attached to the cell wall, but also shrink because there's less water. What will happen is something called the cell will be plasmalized. This is just a scientific term again, but what it really means is for a plant cell specifically, only plant cells, you can think of, remember the box right here? I'm going to try to use this, I guess. Or maybe, I think I can draw it. Let me see if I can draw it. This will be a lot better to show everyone here. Okay, so we have, let me use the correct colors here. So we have the green box here. This is going to be the cell wall. 
and let's use this light tan for the cell membrane. So we have the cell membrane here, but when the cell loses water, it's actually gonna pull across away. So you can see that there's actually like, it's pulling away here, it's pulling away here. And eventually this causes the cell just to die because it's pulling away so much. And let me draw the correct cell, what it should look like. So you guys get a better idea. So we have the box of the plant cell here. And here we have the cell membrane, which is just right, like right next to it. And it's, oh geez, the computer's kind of lagging right now. Okay, it's just right next to it. And there's really not gonna be any space between the two. This is compared to when it starts to lose water, it shrinks. But then the cell wall does not shrink because it's so strong and rigid. And eventually the plant cell will just plasmize and die. So I answered the one for your plant cells, but now I need to answer and talk a little bit about what actually happens for animal cells. Animal cells are a little different here. There's two things that can happen with animal cells as well. We have our really just a regular shape here. When a lot of water leaves the cell, so I'm using the arrows to show how the water goes out, this will cause it to become like this. And it literally becomes very small. Now, if you think about it though, the cell is huge and it had like all of the organelles and everything, they had space, but now you, you shrink it and it's become very small just like the other one, and then it's just gonna die as well because all the organelles pressed together, it can't handle it. On the other side, there is also the extreme of having too much water. What that does, the plant cell, I can draw up here, I believe, it does the opposite. It'll actually grow the, sorry, this is the animal cell if I said plant cell, okay. It'll actually grow the cell until the cell membrane cannot hold it anymore and it'll burst, just like a water balloon. When you try to keep filling it with water and water and water, it eventually just bursts because the water balloon cannot handle that much space and that much water. So uh, I'm going to draw, actually I'm going to draw it down here. We have our normal cell here. What happens is it grows really big, let's say like that, but then as it's growing, there's already these holes that are forming. Just like when you fill up a water balloon, and um, let me draw the water real quick here. Oops. Oops, there we go, got the water. The water starts spewing out here. And so the cell dies. Because think about it, you have a hole in your water balloon. What if you put a beads that represented like the ribosomes? All of a sudden the ribosomes are just leaving the cell. But you need the ribosomes to make your proteins and you need the nucleus to hold the DNA, all sorts of stuff. So then the cell dies as well. Lastly, this is a quite a long question, but I hope everyone's learning a lot from it. With the plant cell, what happens if you give the plant cell a lot of water? What happens? This is where the cell wall being very rigid helps the cell. We already have the basic here with the, the plant cell and then the membrane. What'll happen, I'm going to have to draw a little bit smaller, but you got to remember it's still like on a bigger scale. The plant cell will actually become like this. Oh, it was a little bit too, oh, geez, it kind of lagged out. Okay, oh, that's the end. Wait, let me redraw it somewhere else. I'll draw it down in this corner here. So you take a look here, and then you can kind of still see that it's a rectangle, but then you notice that it's really bulging here. Like, we look right here, like, look at this bulge. It's like bulging, like, here, here, here. What's happening is, the cell wall is so strong that it started off straight, right? But then the water is kind of forcing it to bulge. But it's almost like a triple layer water balloon. It's not going to burst. It's going to stay like that. And the very interesting thing is the plant cells actually like to be like this because when it bulges out, that's how they're supposed to be. And they'll stand up even straighter, which is really good for them. So I hope I answered your question. All right, that was a very thorough answer. So the next question we have here is when, how do cell know when to divide? That's a very good question as well. So we're gonna talk about this again in the future in more detail, but there are these certain things called regulators. You can think about like switches. You have a control panel with all these switches and then it'll control sort of how the cell will divide. Like, is the cell gonna divide now or is it gonna divide later? And one major part of this is actually 
has a cell duplicated its DNA. Because remember, it's going to divide into two cells. Each cell needs to have its own DNA. But if it hasn't duplicated already, how is it going to give each side its equal DNA? It can't. So that's one thing that these regulators end up checking for is like, do you have two copies of your DNA first? And then, then you can go through this, this DNA, sorry, this cell division where one will go to the other and then one will go to the other. All right, so I don't think we have any more questions. It's very late already. Uh, hang on, we just got one more. What happens when you have too little or too many cells? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I yeah. didn't really hear it. So what happens when you have too little or too many cells? Okay, so you have too little cells. Again, we're going to have a smaller organism, like a bacteria only has a couple cells or just one cell or two little cells, it'll really change like what kind of species you are because we have a lot of cells. We have 30 trillion cells, that's a lot of cells. But bacteria only has sometimes one or only a couple cells and it really depends on their function, or sorry, it really alters their function, excuse me. And this will make it so that those cells are just completely different from us and the way they work is also completely different. Right. So really, they're really just, just different, different yeah. species and yeah. Okay, so I think we got all the questions and if you have any more questions, please save them for next time because it's very late already and we will address more questions in future seminars. So for now, thank you so much, Ryan, for that captivating thank seminar. Thank you, thank you, Kathy. Thank yeah. you. Thanks to everyone for coming. Yeah, I think everyone learned a lot and a uh, big thank you to everyone who asked questions. We will have more seminars in the future, and we will also have more on biology with our very own Ryan Kern right here. So we will be diving deeper into the subject of biology, and we welcome you to join us in those. So again, thank you to everyone who is here with us today. I hope all of you had fun and learned a lot. And thank you, and have a great day. Bye, Bye. everyone.